Happy Christmas Eve and from New Home Baptist Church. Glad you could join me today. Wanted to take the opportunity to share the Christmas lesson that's in our discipleship training book. And uh, don't run away if you don't follow that class or you don't have a book, that's okay. We're going to primarily just stay in the Word and invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher here today. Why don't we do that right now? Father, thank you for another opportunity to share your word. Lord, thank you for the gift that you gave us at Christmas. Thank you for sending him to die for us. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us understand this word. We just thank you and praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our lesson is called The Word Became Flesh. And a lot of folks get hot and bothered about the virgin birth around Christmas time, but that's really just part of the miracle of the incarnation of God becoming a man. God the Son became flesh. Uh, sometimes we call Easter Resurrection Day. We might should call Christmas Incarnation Day. It's really very profound what happened. Um, you might, many of you probably have heard of the radio legend Paul Harvey. If he was before your time, you missed out. You need to Google him and listen to him sometime. But he told this story once uh, about a man that he didn't name. He didn't name this guy. But he did not accept the idea of the incarnation. It just seemed too impossible for him. And he didn't want to go to church and just pretend that he believed it. So I guess we can respect him for that, at least, that he didn't want to be a hypocrite. But um, his family went to church without him. He stayed home, and he heard something hitting his window. He went outside, and there was a group of birds probably migrating for the winter, and the cold had overtaken them. They just couldn't go any farther. He took pity on them, opened the doors of his barn, turned the light on, and tried in various ways to get them to go inside. But in the end, they just wouldn't do it. They were too afraid of him. And he actually had the thought, if I could become a bird, then I could relate to them. I could talk to them in their own language and let them know that they had nothing to fear. And that's when it hit him. He understood why Jesus came, why the incarnation. And he hit his knees in the snow. Uh, we are in John chapter 1. Usually we're looking at Luke 2 or Matthew 2 at, at Christmas. But the more I, I studied this lesson, uh, the more profound I realized it was. I'm going to start first uh, in the first five verses here before we get into the main part of the lesson. Verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was, was in the beginning with God. Uh, right off the bat, the apostle here, he, it's like uh, he dropped an 80-pound bag of concrete down at your feet. I was thinking about the concrete and cranes, the VBS over the summer, how many times we saw that bag go plume. But there's so many assertions here. Now, the word is God the Son. And we're going to see that as we read down. But the deity of Christ is not in question here. The equality with the Father is not in question here. He was with God and He was God. The same was in the beginning with God. This makes us think of Genesis 1.1. Uh, he's co-eternal with the Father. He's not a created being. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So another 80-pound bag of concrete, theological concrete. Jesus, God the Son, is the creator as much as God the Father. And it brings uh, some more meaning to this word, word. You know, in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to Moses, came to Isaiah, came to uh, Jeremiah, whoever. But the word of the Lord was a very important concept. And verse 3 here reminds us of the creation account. How did, how did God create? 
He said, let there be light. Let there be this, let there be that. He created with the power of his word. So Jesus was there at the creation. And I know people mock us for believing that, but if the universe we live in really doesn't give us any option but to believe in miracles. Uh, you can believe that the universe created itself out of nothing which came from nowhere for no reason and call that scientific if you want to. But uh, we believe in a miracle with a miracle worker. You know, naturalism proposes a miracle with no miracle worker. Uh, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and, that li and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Different translations uh, translate that different ways. But um, I remember John 3.19. We talked about it last Sunday night, and I think Cliff even said it Sunday morning. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now, the first point is the word came to give life to all who believe. Verses 10 through 13. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So this is a creator stepping into his own creation. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They didn't recognize him before, for who he was. John 5, 39, we looked at this the other night too. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So he is the one that the scriptures testified of, but he wasn't recognized. Verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to, him, to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, not born of blood, the will of flesh, will of the man, are these different ways of saying the same thing, or can we make some fine distinctions? Um, I don't know. I'm not going to uh, try to, you know, go A for A, B for B, but it's not a product of naturalism. It's not a product of something you inherited. I'm sure I have benefited greatly from the prayers of my grandmother, but she didn't genetically pass a salvific gene onto me. Uh, not of the will of the flesh. It's not something that I have accomplished. But of God, it is something that He accomplished. Uh, we say, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. There are some who say, that it really means peace to men of good will. And I know that kind of upsets people if you disturb their understanding of Scripture, but at the very least we have to agree that as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Uh, if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, I don't know that it benefited you at all that he came. Uh, maybe common grace. And when we say common grace, we mean that God doesn't just kill us as soon as we sin. We have space to repent. But if you haven't received him as Savior, you still face that second death, that separation from God when you die. Let me read the fill in the blank that's in our, our book. It's adoption. Adoption into God's family is one of the positive benefits of justification. Not only are we pardoned from the judgment against us through justification, but we also experience a change of identity. We become children of God. Through adoption, our relationship with God, which was once lost through the fall, is now restored, resulting in the benefits of being an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. You sometimes hear... Politicians, celebrities make the statement that we're all God's children. We're all God's children by creation, I suppose that's true. But you want to be God's child by adoption, by spiritual rebirth. 
the most awful human being who ever lived, whoever you want to name that person to be, if you're talking just in terms of creation, you could consider him a child of God. But the, we want to be children of God by spiritual rebirth, by adoption. And that's only given to those who believe. Our second point, the word came to reveal God's glory. Verses 14 and 15. Here it is. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, my buddy at Open Door, he put it on their sign just this week. And... The glory of the incarnation. I, I don't know how we put it into words. Full of grace and truth. Grace is that unmerited favor. And Jesus in 14, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, truth is identified as a person there. You know, he is the truth. He is the one who reveals the truth to us. He reconciled us to God. He revealed the Father to us in a way just like the, um, that man wished he could become a bird. You know, he became a man to reveal truth to us. Now in verse 15, this is John the Baptist that it's talking about. And you may think that's a little unnecessary for me to point that out. But when I first started reading the Bible, I started in Genesis because that's the practical thing to do, I guess, but somebody told me you really need to start in the Gospel of John. So when it got to the part where uh, John was killed, it kind of became unclear to me who wrote the book. So not assuming anything, just pointing out to you. John the Apostle wrote the book, and this is John the Baptist. And he says, He is preferred before me, for he was before me. If you remember in Luke 2, when Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said, Elizabeth, your cousin, is, all, is in her sixth month. She's also with child and is in her sixth month. So we know uh, that John was at least six years older than Jesus. So obviously he's not talking about the physical age. He's talking about that preeminence that he is greater than John. He is the Son of God. Uh, Jesus said John was the greatest man that ever lived, and John said, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. Just uh, quite the contrast there between God and man. Okay, let's look at the next fill in the blank. Jesus' humanity. In addition to being fully divine, the Bible also affirms that Jesus is fully human. Not only does the Old Testament affirm that the promised one, Messiah, would be a man, but the New Testament also affirms that Jesus' earthly life bore all the marks of a human being. Uh, the Word became flesh. He may have been born after John, but he was before John in every other sense of the Word. Okay, our last point, the Word came to provide grace and truth. Verses 16 through 18. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. That term there, grace for grace, that uh, results in a lot of debate, I guess. But we've said it over and over again, or it's been said in this church anyway. You know, even if Jesus never did anything else for us, uh, when he saved us, he did more than we could ever ask or deserve. Verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law, the Old Testament law, it, it portrayed God's holy standard to us, perfection, His moral law. But grace came by Jesus Christ, our inability to keep the law. He gave us grace to reconcile us with God. And truth, truth came by Jesus Christ. 
Well, it's not that the old law wasn't the truth, but Jesus made that righteousness attainable for us because when we place our faith in him, his righteousness is imputed to us. Verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Uh, no man has seen him at any time. And uh, Exodus thirty-three twenty, 20, uh, the Lord told Moses that no one can see my glory and live. Uh, just like those little birds were terrified of that man. You know, if he could have become a bird, then he could have revealed himself to them in a different way that we could see the Father. I think, I can't remember if it was Thomas or who said, show us the Father, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. The translation in our workbook says, the one and only Son who is himself God. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but it may be more of an interpretation than, than translation. But the idea of in the bosom is one and the same, that closeness, that intimacy between the Father and the Son. I'm going to leave you with this quote from C.S. Lewis. The pure light walks the earth. The darkness received into the heart of deity is there swallowed up. Where except in uncreated light can darkness be drowned? The darkness has not overcome it. Uh, the light has come into the world. It's not just some uh, sentimental story that we tell. It is to a lot of people. They don't mind the shepherds. They don't mind the angels. They don't mind uh, the romantic stories of wise men following a star, peaceful animals sleeping around a, a cozy little stable, which was probably actually quite dirty. It was probably a much more grungy and grimy scene than what we're accustomed to. But it's, it's not just some story that we tell along with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and whatever. Uh, it is God coming into the world to save us, to save us from our sin, our sin that condemns us to hell. That's what he came to save us from. That is the gift of Christmas. It's not a new bicycle or an Xbox or even a new car. These car manufacturers, boy, they just dying for people to give cars as Christmas presents. I don't know who they're advertising to, but it's not me. But uh, just like last Sunday, when we looked at John and Peter talking to this uh, lame man in the temple, it says, silver and gold we do not have, but what we give, we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, silver and gold, uh, we can't take it with us. It perishes. It only provides a temporary uh, happiness for us. But we have an eternal joy in Jesus Christ if we trust him as our Savior. And that's my prayer for you this Christmas, if you have not done it, to, to make him yours. And if you need to talk about it, contact us. We're here. We would love to share more with you. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you again just for the great gift that you gave us, that you came to save us from our sin. And we just pray that someone listening or watching will ask you into, your, into their hearts this Christmas. And we just can't thank you enough for what you've done for us. Uh, from the manger to the cross, we just thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas.